Okay, good morning, everybody, uh, and good evening. Um, this is Yi Chui. I'm a professor at Stanford University right here, uh, executive editor of NanoLetter. It's my great pleasure to <laughs> welcome you back to this uh, monthly NanoScience Global Lecture. Uh, you have been seen uh, in the past number of events, we have uh, really the world leading scientists, uh, both in well established and also early career uh, scientists to come to tell us what's the latest, hottest in, in the nanoscience and also quite a bit of our past history reveal as well. So today uh, we have three outstanding speakers. They are uh, Professor Chen Chen from uh, Uni University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Professor Lars Samuelson from Lund University and Professor Julia Greer from Caltech. Uh, we, you are going to see three different topics, but all very, very exciting related to nanoscience. Uh, this year is a nanoscience um, 20 years anniversary. Certainly it's very exciting. The journal has been contributing to the whole community a lot by publishing the, um, the best works um, in a timely manner. We'll continue this series for next you know, number of months to come. Now today, let me come to the first speaker's uh, introduction, Professor Chen Chen. Uh, she's an uh, assistant professor in Department of Material Science Engineering and the uh, UIUC. She obtained her uh, bachelor's degree from Peking University and PhD from UIUC. She's just returned back several years ago to UIUC as a faculty. She did postdoc with uh, Paul Alvarez in UC Berkeley under the Miller, Miller uh, Fellowship. She's well known starting from her PhD work, colloidal cell assembly, not using uh, you know, um, electron microscopy technique and, and, and so on to look at very interesting problem. Uh, she received a number of uh, exciting awards, including the Le Maire Award at ACS, Forbes 30 under 30 science list in uh, 2016, Air Force Young Investigator Award, NSF Career Award, Sloan Fellowship, and uh, you can see uh, her track record just outstanding. With that, uh, Chen, I, I would like to uh, take it over. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, this is Chen. I'd like to use an art question to motivate my talk today. We all know Vincent Van Hao, and some of us know once he was really happy with his new bedroom in Ahala. So what other ways for him to share and describe his new bedroom? One way he used was to use words to detail the shape and position of everything, like in his letter to his little brother, but the other way was to paint it, as shown here. So in comparison to words, a painting has direct spatial information, and there can be many different ways to interpret the interplay between light, color, and shadow. Van Hal's time did not have computers, but more than 100 years later, with computation power, he were able to do extensive data analysis on the brush stroke and painting style to revisit history and his art all based on this one very old image. So inspired by the power of direct imaging and image analysis in this art question, our scientific ambition is similar. We hope to collect experimental data with direct spatial and temporal information. We hope to collect the data that can stand the test of time that can be reinterpreted by other people many years later. So that's why my group has been focusing on cinematography at the nanoscale. I'll give you a flavor by what I mean by cinematography by showing you two illustrations. On the top, it shows how we can take movies or nanoparticles by, by looking at them in solution, observe, observing their vivid, somewhat agitated motions. And then at the bottom, if we're dealing with a more complicated sample, we can actually piece together all the snapshots of the same sample taking a different orientations into one single movie from which we can derive the 3D structure. So based on this core of cinematography techniques, 
we can now start to take various types of movies, including movies of phase transitions, movies of shape morphing in polymers, movies of biomolecular dynamics, which are usually taken or produced by molecular dynamics simulation, but now we can see so in electron microscopy, or movies of electrochemical reactions to trace the motions or charges with the propagation strain in energy storage and conversion devices. So for today's talk, I'm going to refocus on the top two types of movies. They represent two types of nanoscale systems, in phase transitions, we focus on inorganic nanoparticles. They are rigid, crystalline, monodispersed, and regularly shaped. In comparison, proteins are soft, amorphous, heterogeneous, or complexly shaped, and as a result, serve as an adventurous direction my group has been pushing. So in both directions, I'll show you how our capability to take movies at nanoscale can provide us with new insights. So the first scientific question we will look into is the emergence of order, or namely the nucleation of growth at the nanoscale from an otherwise disordered suspension of nanosized building blocks. The relevance is actually quite broad from nanoparticle superlattices whose size and structure determine their performances to biominerals consisting of natural building blocks. However, the current status of the field is actually a large gap. So in those three and many other papers, what people usually present are just single snapshots. So for a long time within this single snapshots, we do not really know how the individual nanoparticles suspending solution undergoing random Brownian motion can come together to form into an order structure. We do not really know the fundamental crystallization pathway that really determine the size, shape, crystallinity of the final crystal, as well as their the applications. Moreover, in this 2015 review paper, it points out a long-standing theoretical challenge in model and nanoparticle interactions because they're non-additive. So simulating such pathway has also been very difficult. So in this context, my group's unique contribution in this part of the story is to provide an unprecedented type of experimental data and data analysis. Instead of showing you single snapshots, I'm going to show you real space movies. Here is an example of a nanoparticle super lattice relaxing itself in solutions agitated by thermal fluctuation. And the reason why such movies have been difficult to capture is because for a long time, the nanometer resolving transmission electron microscopy, or TEM, is not compatible with the liquid sample due to its high vacuum working condition. So here comes my group's unique expertise together with the whole community's effort on liquid phase TEM, which allows you to image a liquid sample against a high vacuum of TEM. You can use a microfabricated liquid chamber, or you can use two graphene layers to sandwich and seal a liquid sample in between. So the idea was to use liquid phase TEM to watch crystallization in real space. The idea was perfect, but just with one complication, and that's because the electron beam in TEM has high energy they can actually react with nanoparticles to change their shape during liquid phase TEM imaging. Well, this is wonderful if you want to study nanoparticle growth or corrosion dynamics, as shown in this beautiful movie here, it can really fundamentally damage the crystallization when nanoparticles behave as building blocks. So this is a challenge first recognized by my postal daughter, Junyang Kim. So the first few papers he published with us was really trying to push the electron beam intensity to be as low as possible in liquid phase TM imaging. So at this very low electron beam intensity, he was able to completely eliminate the beam induced nanoparticle reactions and heating effects so that he can observe this nanoparticle self assembling dynamics shown here. So build upon this efforts, I'll show you nowadays how liquid phase TEM is no longer just a fancy imaging tool capturing mysterious dynamics unique to a being intensive, highly confined environment. Instead, it can really provide validations to existing theories and then provide guidance to experiments outside TEM. So the first scientific question we focus on is nucleation. The first appearance of crystallized in otherwise disordered solution. In the modern field of crystallization, classical nucleation is often challenged. 
So people speculate there can be various different types of um, intermediates on its path towards the formation of the final crystal. However, the knowledge has been mostly on atomic systems. So I'm going to show you the nucleation pathway with nano-sized building blocks. So this is our nano-sized building block to begin with, gold triangular nanoprisms. So you can see the size and shape in this dry TM image, they appear dark due to the TM contrast. The size is about 100 nanometer in length and then 7.5 nanometer in thickness. And on this slide, I'm going to show you a liquid phase TM movie. So in experimentally, what we do is we load the aqueous suspension of individual triangular nanoprisms into TEM, and then we trigger the crystallization in situ. At the very beginning, the movie looks very cloudy. You see dark shapes fly in and out, and that's because nanoparticles are undergoing Brownian motion in solution. But gradually, you can see this beautiful hexagonal lattice emerges from the disordered structure. So that was extremely exciting for us because it was the first time we can see nanoparticle superlattice formation in real space and real time. And I should highlight, this is only possible after we did every possible optimization in every single experimental step, which we detailed in our 75 page supporting information, which is something I'm very proud of. And then if you look at the movie multiple times, you might also get puzzled. We started from triangular prisms, so why the dark shapes look so circular, or why they pack into a hexagonal lattice? Fortunately, liquid phase TM allows direct imaging, so are able to capture series where individual prisms first sit flat on the substrate, and then another prism come flying in, stack on top of it into a column, but not in perfect registry. So this misalignment can actually build up to make that projection of the column in TEM more and more circular. And interestingly, even after it reaches equilibrium, the columns can still locally vibrate a lattice site as a way to dissipate energy. And this structure has been verified by multicolor simulation done by my collaborators, Eric Lawton and Zui of Northwestern. This is to verify the system is thermodynamically driven it's not really dictated by electron beam artifacts. And now let's actually look at what we can learn from the movies. So this is when my students house passion on thermodynamics play a role. So he uses the machineries in statistical mechanics to analyze the movies as shown here. On the left is a raw liquid phase TM movie. Now with each column checked as the green dots, and then on the right, we can actually do this runaway cell analysis to highlight the bound connection network. And then based on this bound connection network, we can calculate two local order parameters for each single column. One local order parameter is the bound orientational order parameter, which highlights how locally ordered the structure is. And the other is local density. Because we have a lot of columns, we have a long movie, we can actually plot out a probability map in this order parameter space. So if you look at this 2D map here, your eyes can see two populated states. And interestingly, beyond this one state with a high structure order and high local density, which is our final crystal, we also have another state with no structure order and high local density. And that's our amorphous pre-nucleation precursor. So this non-classical nucleation is also verified in our real space snapshots. You can see the red crystallized cell only start to form as the blue amorphous domain grows to a critical size. And this is repeatedly so as we collapse the data for multiple movies into this one single master curve. In a later work of ours, we're actually able to calculate the kinetic nucleation barrier, which is indeed lowered in the presence of this amorphous pre-nucleation precursor. So this is our understanding of nucleation pathway at a nanoscale. And of course, we can extend to other questions related to the formation and relaxation order, now that we have the technique. So in another collaboration we have with Eric, we noticed this uh, universal layer by layer growth mode, which can be a beautiful strategy to make perfectly smooth crystal out of nanoparticles. Sometimes small clusters composed of nanoparticles can merge to grow bigger with the interfacial fluctuation following capillary waves. 
And sometimes, depending on the symmetry of the lattices, they can fall into Maxwell lattice. They can have soft modes to allow for spontaneous reconfiguration. And such lattices can serve as good candidates for mechanical metal materials. And lastly, as we build layers of nanoparticles into three dimension, due to the balance of interlayer and interlayer attraction, they can form into beautiful unconventional patterns, such as this uh, Morio pattern showing here. And of course, this list can keep being expanded now that we establish these protocols of direct imaging and image analysis at the nanoscale. So this is a story we have with inorganic nanoparticles, very well structured, very ordered, appear to most people in my group, except to Johnny. So Johnny appreciates the complexity of proteins. He loves watching animations showing how nanosized proteins transform their shape, move to perform their functions in living cells. In fact, he loves watching those movies so much that hope, he hoped to replace such animation with real experimental data. And of course, this is a dream shared by many pioneers. There are two Nobel Prizes given to direct nanoscopic imaging relevant to biological system. One is cryo-electron microscopy, which can give you beautiful resolution 3D shapes of single proteins, but it's not dynamic because a sample is frozen. You cannot study the protein motion, the protein uh, self-assembly with that in-situ response to external stimulus. In comparison, super-resolution optic microscopy is compatible with the liquid sample and dynamics. However, its terms of nanometer resolution is really in locating proteins. It does not really resolve the nanoscale morphology of proteins. So it's due to those limitations, that's why animations are showing here are largely made based on the insights provided by MD simulation. And then the recent breakthrough of AlphaFold can allow you to predict the 3D shape of a protein based on its amino acid sequence. They can only do so through extensive training on this huge protein structure bank. If we want to use this strategy to predict protein dynamics, we also need to have a huge experimental database. So in this context, Johnny's vision is to combine the merits of those two experimental techniques. On one hand, being able to resolve single proteins with the best possible spatial resolution, and then on the other hand, still allow liquid, still allow dynamics. In doing so, we can actually validate MD simulation. We can actually extend the system size and also time scale way beyond MD simulation. And hopefully one day we can create a protein dynamics bank for machine learning and for prediction. The exact system we focus on is membrane proteins. In living systems, where well, mostly consists of water to sustain cells defined by cellular membranes. So the membrane proteins are the proteins that sit adjacent or across cellular membranes. They are widely relevant, serve as more than one third of the drug targets. They are pretty big in size, so they can have good TM contrast. They need to stay in lipids, so even their structural characterization has been difficult. Solid state NMR could be difficult because the proteins can be too large to interpret. Extra crystallography could also be difficult because our bulk crystalline form can be very different from their functional form in the presence of membranes. So that is actually how we can have a unique entrance into this undercharted territory. The exact system we're looking to is nano disks. So it's showing this a schematic here, a nano disk has three components. The membrane protein in the middle, and then the lipid bilayers surrounding it, which is further circled by a belt protein. So in this way, we can make sure the membrane protein is actually in its close to native lipid environment to stay stable. At the same time, it's still as easily processable as a nanoparticle suspension. We use the graphene result to do the imaging, which gives us the best contrast, which can also minimize electron beam damage. I should mention this is an extremely difficult experiment. So I still remember one night at 11 p.m. when Johnny sent me this email uh, with this movie attached, the first ever movie of a dynamic nano disk in solution. So in this movie, the scale bar is 20 nanometer. Uh, the system is not restrained. The nano disk was fluctuating because it's no longer frozen. And the size of the nano disk actually matches really well with the prediction based on the belt protein length. 
And then if you look closely into the intensity profile inside the nano disk, you can see those black features, which are the membrane proteins. In other words, we can actually check the motion and orientation of the, nan uh, of the membrane proteins inside the nano disk, which is consistent with what we can see from MD simulation. And then we can also extract biological information outside of, out of this uh, undulations of the exterior uh, counterfactuation of the nano disks. So shown here, we can decompose those real space fluctuations into a series of deformation modes in the reciprocal space. I'll skip the math, but just highlight to you one fact and one plot. So the fact is, it turns out the elliptical deformation mode contribute predominantly to the fluctuation. And the plot is shown here. The y-axis is the Fourier transform modes, and the x-axis is the wave factor. There are three pieces of information I hope to highlight to you here. The first information is as we overlay the data from MD simulation with our experiment, they overlap decently well with each other, highlighting the fluctuation is actually generic. Second, sometimes the fluctuation can actually fall into this bending dominant region with a minus four power law in this high Q region with small length scale region due to intermolecular interaction. And then it can also fall into this uh, stretch dominance region with a minus pool power law corresponding to this low Q region or large length scale region corresponding to large surface tension. And lastly, from fitting these two curves, we can actually back out what is the surface tension and what is the bending modulus, all from this uh, real space movies. And lastly, if we actually allow the nano disk to relax themselves for a longer time, we can just see surprises showing here they can actually form into fingers and then come back to its regular circular shape. So I should mention this observation is only possible during our minutes of duration in experimental observation. It's not really observed in our MD simulation, possibly due to the limited time scale there. We can also do the same Fourier transform analysis for stage one and stage three and their data actually perfectly overlap with each other, which shows there is a complete recovery in both the shape and also the mechanical property of the nano disk. And lastly, the nano disk can always keep a domain about 10 nanometer in size. So we attribute this domain size to this strong lipid protein interaction because a membrane protein in the middle can actually hold very tightly the surrounding lipid molecules surrounding them, even during this very vigorous uh, shape transformation of fingering. And again, all those biological insights are only possible. Now we can see biomolecular dynamics movies. So with that, I'd like to wrap up by looking to the future of cinematography at the nanoscale. Machine learning based data analysis can further help us to extract physical meaning from the movies, as well as get experiment on the fly. We can also involve other techniques such as liquid phase AFM to allow correlative imaging. In terms of systems, we can go beyond equilibrium phase transitions into non-equilibrium behaviors. We can go from single proteins to protein assemblies and their interaction with bacteria. In applications, we can further push for shape morphing based polymer engineering. We can also push for atomic and chemical imaging of energy related devices. So that's the future way invasion. And that's all that I have to offer for today. I'd like to thank my group and thank my funding agencies who make the work presented here possible. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take uh, any questions you have. Well, thank you very much, Chen. Uh, this is really, really interesting. You are giving uh, two outstanding examples right here. I enjoy very much. Uh, Chen, the first question mm -hmm. uh, relates to your, uh, the nano prism uh, mm -hmm. self assembly. You show this, they stack up together, but not entirely overlap, right? Mm -hmm. And then the cross section become more and more like circular shape. And then this column start to self assemble. Uh, is there a relationship between this nano prism, whether this uh, crystallography orientation registry prefer registry between the stack or not? Yes, yes, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So I skipped some details here. Uh, for those nano prisms, they are coated with charged 
files. So when they're dispersed in water, they have vanderous attraction and electrostatic repulsion. So basically, vanderous attraction will help them to be perfectly aligned with each other, but electrostatic repulsion will prefer them to stay away from each other. So that's why they won't be stacked perfectly uh, in alignment with each other. And that's why in the end, the column become very circularly shaped. And that's actually why for circularly shaped cylinders, they tend to form into this hexagonal packing. So in terms of the exact misalignment angle, uh, we couldn't really resolve it in experiments, but we could actually learn some insights from simulation. So in simulation, it turns out it's actually quite randomized. It's actually due to this randomization, we can have really a circularly shaped cylinder shape to actually lead to this final crystallization. Yeah. So in your liquid TEM, uh, it's not possible yet to do this not enough time or maybe those to do diffraction? Uh. That's, a, that's a great question. So uh, in terms of the uh, length of time for observation in liquid phase TEM, for our inorganic nanoparticles, now we can actually really observe them up to hours of time, as long as we control the electron beam dose rate to be low enough. So diffraction is actually a very exciting topic. It's just something we haven't done yet. We actually hope to, in the future, hope to involve uh, electron diffraction, which will be particularly interesting for energy devices to really see that structure change. So that's a possibility. And then when it comes to biological samples, they're just a lot more being sensitive. So, so far with our optimized condition, we can observe them up to minutes of duration for now. In the future, we hope we can actually optimize both the imaging condition and also the samples. For example, maybe you can actually add some um, of quenchers or free radicals to really minimize the electron being damaged during the imaging. And in that way, hopefully, we can actually cover a longer time of observation. Yeah. Well, Chen, speaking of your biological sample, mm -hmm. the nano disk. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the total dose you, you say you can observe about two minutes? So right. what's the electron per angstrom square of those? These accumulate over time. Right, right. That's that's a great, great question. So so I can I can first say uh, the dose rate we use is actually just uh, uh, about several electrons per angstrom square per second. And then in accumulating this movie, indeed, we capture up to minutes. And then during this uh, up to minutes, as I show in the movie on the, on the last slide, we can actually recharacterize both the shape and the mechanical property to really verify, at least on the mechanical property level, the nano disk is still following our prediction. I should mention to really make this experiment possible is actually very important for us to use a graphene liquid cell. So graphing as the window material to re sandwich a liquid sample somehow has been shown to greatly decrease the electron being damaged, possibly due to the fact that graphene can conduct charge and also heat very quickly. So that's still something we don't really know fundamentally, but phenomenologically, it seems that we can actually observe the sample continuously up to minutes. And we also have control experiments when we just continue to observe the sample for a much longer time. That's when you can visibly see the nano disk start to become disintegrated and even damaged in terms of its shape. Yeah. Well, Chen, thank you very much. So at the end of the today's event, we'll have a panel discussion. We'll, we'll talk then. Now let me introduce the second speaker of today, uh, <clears throat> Professor Lars Samuelson. Well, Lars is uh, already a long, long time friend. Uh, he's a professor of solid state physics, uh, a scientific leader of Nano Lund. It's a center for nano science in, in uh, Lund University in Sweden. Um, Lars is really a pioneer in the field of uh, semiconductor nanostructure, primary on the nanowire. You know, study its optical and transport property and application in nanoelectronics, photonics, solar cell, and solid state lighting. He's a fellow of the Institute of Physics, a fellow of American Physical Society, and a member of Loyal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and a member of Loyal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. Well, he has won many awards I don't uh, need to go into. Um, I also like to mention he's uh, the founder of uh, several startup company. Uh, I see three, 
uh, in the public domain like Q, Q Nano, Solve Voltag, <laughs> Voltag is in, uh, in Glow AB. And with that, uh, Lars, please take over the podium. Lars, you're on mute. That look okay. Looks good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yi, for the introduction. Uh, actually, it was a little bit old uh, information. I'm not any longer the head of the Nano Lund, but I'll say something about that in a minute. First, uh, it was great to have the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I was really surprised and very honored when uh, Yi and Terry contacted me. Uh, I'm, this is a follow-up on several of my heroes in the field, like, uh, you know, Paul Alevisato, Steve Cho, well, now my under a game, et cetera, et cetera. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, as you said, uh, I am Professor Lund University Physics Department, Nano Lund. Uh, I'm since the uh, beginning of this year also part-time affiliated with the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, China, and I'm working uh, quite a lot also with the companies with the, I'd say pre predominantly today Hexadam, but also with the uh, Glow and the uh, QNano. Um, I gave actually two titles. The first title is the one you see on top, 20 years of nano wire and nanomaterials research for fun and for applications. And then I had the one that was more solidly scientific on what we're doing today. But I would actually start out by doing a bit of a historical, nano-historical perspective looking back 100 years, 60, 40, 30, 20, 10 years. I do that quickly, so it's not going to take up too much of our time. Uh, then I'll, uh, for the 20 years of the, of the nano letters, I'll give some examples of what we've been doing the first five years, the second five years, the third and the fourth, covering 2000 to 2020. And uh, at the very end, I, I concentrate on, on ongoing research, namely development of relaxed seaplane in gallium nitride templates for red, green, and blue emitting nano LEDs, uh, which I think illustrates how materials research can contribute to solving an urgent application need. So uh, the historical, looking back, uh, 100 years ago, there was in Göttingen, labeled quantum mechanique, but also in Copenhagen and other places, great progress by people like Max Born, Van Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrodinger, and others. But the great thing is that still this quantum mechanics science is forming the basis for very much of modern nanoscience. And it has, of course, for these 20 years and will probably for a long time still to come. Um, 60 years ago, approximately 60 years ago, Richard Feynman made this historical speech at the meeting of the American Physical Society. There is a plenty of room at the bottom where he, among other things, said that the principles of physics, as far as I can see, do not speak against the possibility of maneuvering things atom by atom. Uh, around 40 years ago, there was uh, two, some people called it crazy, ambitious guys at, at IBM in, in Rüsselsheim, Switzerland, who made this impossible mechanical device, scanning tunnel microscope, by which one is able to see and uh, manipulate atoms, uh, as well as uh, other uh, you know, nano-objects, molecules, etc. And indeed, uh, the right-hand illustration there is from what Don Eigler did maybe 10 or 20 years later in manipulating atoms and forming actually uh, quantum mechanical systems. Uh, about 30 years ago, I did initiate, a little bit more than 30 years ago actually, in, in Lund, what is now called Nano Lund, I was his leader for the first 25 years. Today, actually, the leader is Professor Anders Mikkelsen, who is a super strong materials surface scientist, specializing in scanning probe and, and synchrotron techniques. I would say he's probably my strongest recruit for the research environment many, many years ago now, but and still going, developing very, very strongly. 
Um, <clears throat> so what happened 20 years ago? Yeah, we know. That was the realization of a new journal and the release of the first and the leading international journal of nanoscience and nanotechnology and nanoletters. Um, the first 10 years were very, very busy. It was very much nanomaterials, very much nanowires. That's probably one reason why at the 10th anniversary celebration event, uh, I was listed high up in this most prolific authors, together with some of my materials, heroes, friends, like Song Ling Wang, Charles Lieber, Paul Alvesatos, Peyton Yang, Peyton Boris, Naomi Halas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was also a great historical event. So uh, next to what we did in the first five years, uh, I say we're concentrating on fundamental nanowire growth studies and also on the ability to realize and employ one dimensional heterostructures. So it was just uh, at the time uh, when the Nobel Prize went to the people that developed the planar heterostructures for physics and for devices, uh, like uh, Herb, Herb Kromer and Soros Alfiero, uh, the Nobel Prize year 2000. And uh, I think we were not only in seeing how could one do in making one dimensional counterparts of that. So, what you will be able to maybe I should have a pointer. So what you can see, I think this is a rather famous early publication. It was already in February 2002 about the, the steeplechase of electrons jumping over these uh, barriers in, in one dimensional devices. We also spent a lot of efforts on trying to understand what indeed is, is controlling the growth of the nanowires, what happens at the interface between the catalytic or quasi-catalytic metallic particle or droplet and the nanowire underneath. We uh, had a lot of fun also trying to make three-dimensional structures like these nano forests that Kimberly spent a lot of work on. But also we used this later in another, in another nano letters paper uh, to make uh, networks of self-assembling, self-forming huge networks of, of nano wires, where you see here the original wire standing out from the surface and then the branches that connect uh, all the neighboring with nodes. Also a lot of effort on trying to understand and control structural properties. This, uh, maybe you can't see the detail, but this is a super lattice, so it's all indium arsenide, but these segments are really a, a cubic zinc blender structures of indium arsenide, and these are hexagonal vertite structures, and you can see eight monolayers of each of them making an interesting super lattice, We're combining these structures with interesting transport and optical properties. Uh, the second five years, we, uh, I think we, we, we made an important attempt to combine standard semiconductor technology like lithographic patterning with growth of nanowire arrays. This is just an example of you know, a dense array of home needles, uh, in this case, in the phosphide. But we're doing that with all kinds of materials. Um, so we used the ability to, for, to control and design complex nanowires in uh, heterostructures, for instance. Uh, this is a, a, a paper from a Fischer of Letter 2007 when Andreas Fuhrer was postdocing in my group. Uh, detailed studies of the spin orbit coupling in, in the quantum dots containing two electrons. Yeah. Uh, here is another important breakthrough. We had a big European program that I was coordinating together with Klaus Delander in making non wire based one dimensional electronics with most of European industries. Here you see the vertical nanowire and its, its wrap gate controlling the flow still a technology that is pretty hot in the industrial development, to say the least. But also a lot of efforts in, in life science. Here's some of the stuff that I did together with Jonas Tegenfeld uh, on nanofluidics in hollow nanowires, when we made core shell nanowires etched out the core and could then make nanosyringes that can penetrate cells and inject and extract the nanomaterials, stuff that is still going on. Um, the third five years, uh, 2010 to 2015, uh, I point at uh, three different important breakthroughs there, for us important at least. <laughs> the stuff that uh, Jesper Valentin and Magnus Boyström developed for indium phosphide nanowire array solar cells, achieving 13.8% efficiency by exceeding the ray optics limit, where you see the very careful design of the spacing, the internal structures, diameters, lengths, contact regions, and everything to optimally absorb 
the light, even when we only covered, say, 10 or 12 percent of the surface with nanowires, we could absorb, if not 100 percent, so at least pretty close to 100 percent of all the photons. Um, another important area is, of course, the, the LED effort that we've done together with GLOW, and there was a, a review book chapter article about that that might be interesting to refer to. Nanowire-based visible light emitters, present status and outlook, which was a joint publication between us at Lund University and uh, Nate Gardner at uh, GLOW. Um, the third example is this uh, new, uh, continued effort in making more and more <laughs> challenging and interesting materials development like the growth of nanowires without substrates by continuous growth from catalytic gold particles in an aerosol phase we call this aerotaxi in this uh, nature paper from december 2012 continuous gas phase synthesis of nanowires with tunable properties uh, this actually you see it, it was actually a little bit after uh, 2015. So now the, the last five years a lot of efforts on being more relevant for industrial development like upscaling from nano to macro and new industrial applications. And uh, I gave one example there, the joint effort with, with GLOW on the LEDs. Uh, now I wanted to be a little bit more specific on the materials research, nanomaterials research we're doing. And I have this topic development of relaxed sea planing gun templates, as I said, for RGB emitting nano LEDs. So this is illustrating how materials research can contribute to solving an urgent application need. So this contains very many people's contribution. I just, uh, for the, the limited time, highlight uh, two, three people here. Shosha B, who is the main grower and the main expert in, in the nitride um, materials growth and processing technology, together with several of, of our group members uh, in developing growth and the processing. Anders Gustafsson, who jointly with Professor Rainer Wallenbe in the, in the materials chemistry, has been developed cathode lum and applying cathode luminescence and transmission electron microscopy to understand and, and control and feedback to growth uh, what is coming out of the technology. And of course, now uh, 10, 15 years of collaboration between us in my, my group in Lund and uh, GLOW, Fari Badanesh, who was leading this effort, been leading this effort for at least 10 years and now go, going on in, in uh, Sunnyvale in Silicon Valley. It moved from Lund in 2010. So the first four years were in Lund and then it outgrew all the facilities in Lund and had to move, and move to, to Sunnyvale. So I will first uh, describe a little bit of the market pull for this technology, which indicates the value and the need for red emitting gallium nitride, indium gallium nitride, micro LEDs. And I use uh, as, as to illustrate this market need, the market pull, um, the, re, the micro LED display market industry and technology trends 2020 produced uh, every year. I think they're produced by Yole Development. Um, and this is actually a nice little fellow. He is worth the, the highest quality micro LEDs, I think, to look so pretty. Yeah, okay. Um, th this is one of the slides from this, uh, this review. And what you, the, the important thing to stress here is that it's clear from all kinds of analysis that it's the ec economics that drive the dice, dice size development. Um, to address higher volume TV markets, tablets, laptops, smartphones, you need to go down to smaller and smaller die sizes definitely to go down to and below uh, five microns in size. Here you see some of the traditional applications for LEDs or even mini LEDs like the luxury televisions and smartwatches. They're still in the range of 20 microns or so. You can do that uh, pretty easily in traditional LED technology industrialization. However, to go to high resolution television screens or computer screens, you, need, you really need to be in the realm between five microns. For many applications like the augmented reality, it's uh, clear now that one aims for getting to below two microns. And among the many challenges is to be able to maintain high efficiency, even when you go down to these ultra small devices. This is a very busy slide, but uh, it, it, it contains everything from <laughs> low density to high density uh, dis displays. 
Um, I will not talk about all of this. I will just say it, it contains the assembly aspects, the backplane, I mean, the transistors that drive the LEDs, but specifically in my interest, namely the color. I magnified this little frame down there to make it easier to see. So here you can see that there are really two main approaches to generate the, the colors, either using native RGB, where you, di you directly from the micro LEDs uh, generate the colors, two approaches, either to combine gallium nitride based technologies for the blue and the green, and gallium arsenide based in the gallium aluminum phosphide, and gallium arsenide based for the red. Many companies push this, um, yeah. Uh, and then there is the approach to use gallium nitride for everything, all being gallium nitride, where I think GLOW has definitely been a, a pioneer. There's the other color conversion using phosphorus or using quantum dots in both cases to excite them with blue and maybe UV, and then they generate the green, at least definitely the red, either by phosphorus or by quantum dots. This is also a very big thing for television screens, which I think most of you know. Um, this survey also talks about the, the micro LED versus OLED. This is not really my main topic, but it's still interesting to know. Notice that external quantum efficiency of traditional LEDs far exceeds that of OLEDs. But when you go down to small sizes, say below 20 microns for gallium nitride based LEDs for the blue and green, and below 80 microns for gallium arsenide based LED, you get into efficiency problems, which is really close to my topic. Uh, this frame here is magnified here, so you can see it more clearly. You can see that the micro LEDs are doing quite well for the blue. You go from, this is uh, more than 100 mic large scale, large size, 15 micron, 5 micron, still fine for the blue, still okay for the green. However, when you get to the red, things is getting more problematic. Uh, for the gallium arsenide based, you have, of course, very bright for macroscopic LEDs. But when you go down to 15 and 5 microns, efficiency goes down very quickly. And I would say down in this range, 5 micron, then that's about what you can hope to do by traditional planar, in most cases, traditional planar in the gallium nitride, gallium nitride. And I think both the gallium arsenide and the gallium nitride based technologies, when you get down to, say, 2 microns, then there is not very much of percentages left. So here is uh, some of the advantages with, uh, with uh, micro LEDs for you know, these different displays, smartphones, laptops, tablets, uh, head up displays, augmented reality, virtual reality, smartwatches. Of course, low power consumption, uh, high, ultra high brightness, uh, excellent color gamut, long lifetime, high resolution, pixel densities, et cetera, et cetera. So that brings me back to uh, summarize what all this market pool tells us, at least tells me. So ideally, you need red indium gallium nitride micro LEDs that can generate the, the red, but it seems that you need a substrate with a lattice constant that is larger than that offered by the gallium nitride as the traditional host material. So uh, let me put that a little bit into perspective. Um, to the right here, you see famous, well-known <laughs> faces, Akasaki Amano Nakamura. We in the Academy had the good uh, choice of giving them the Nobel Prize in 2014 for the invention of the efficient blue light emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy saving white light sources. So their techno the technology that they developed, and I think specifically Nakamura brought to the industrialization, was uh, is sketched here. You see on sapphire, for instance, you have a N-type gallium nitride in the bottom. You have the multiple corner wells emitting the light, the blue efficient blue light, and the top P gallium nitride, and you make contact with the P and N side, and there you go, you have your LED. Um, there is problem if you're trying to use this technology for longer wavelengths, uh, that's illustrated down here. You know, if you have, uh, if you make a blue LED, things are fine. You have not so big lattice mismatch between the indium gallium nitride in the corner wells, uh, which is 15%, and that in the gallium nitride substrate, which is both 0%, yes, obviously. Uh, things get a little bit more problematic for the green. There you have 25% uh, indium uh, corresponding to quite se severe lattice mismatch. And now you're down from the very high 70, 80% efficiency for the blue in say 30, 40 or so in, in the green. 
And of course, if you go all the way to the red, you have a huge difference in the lattice constant with the, with the gallium nitride substrate, typically 35% indium, and you actually left with uh, at least rather few uh, single digit uh, efficiency for, for most things that have been reported. So this, of course, has to do with the lattice mismatch here. It's an, in, in numbers, the blue LED, you have 1.6% lattice mismatch for the green 2.7 and for the red 3.8 which means that you get more and more defects in the quantum wells, you get effect of the quantum confined stock effect til tilting the band structures, and you have the uh, effect from polarization phenomena that uh, affect uh, device performance in a, in a negative way. So here is what we've been working on for the last five years. I think I used this sketch when I uh, applied to the Swedish Research Council uh, five or six years ago. Um, it's a Another rather busy slide, and what you see here is the band gap energy of the, the nitride material, the free nitride material. And uh, here you see the, the lattice constant, uh, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, angstrom. Uh, and you have somewhere in the center, left of the center, the gallium nitride point here. So if you go in this direction, you're adding more and more indium. And if you follow it all the way down, you're gonna get the indium nitride. Only 0.7 uh, electron volt band gap. Um, so here you, you can see what you're doing in uh, the, the Nobel awarded uh, technology to make efficient blue LEDs. So what you do is uh, with gallium nitride as your lattice constant, you are for the quantum wells adding indium to a very suitable uh, range. So you're adding 15% indium. So these are now is now the composition of the quantum wells, 15% indium on gallium nitride. And this exercise is working excellently. The, the, the material, as I said, is, is remarkably efficient, uh, close to 80% in efficiency. So my proposal to the research council and to the people around me is say, okay, let's see if we can come up with uh, some techniques of, of replacing the gallium nitride substrate with indium gallium nitride. For instance, 10% indium would be this point here. Assume that we can incorporate indium in the, in the substrate, we would be able to do exactly the same exercise in terms of the materials, variations, and in terms of the, the strain and all that. And you would go horizontally out to this point here, which is 25% indium. So now we have quantum wells of 25% indium grown on 10% indium containing substrate. And if you continue to uh, see if we can still have a, a proposal, uh, if we could put 20% indium into this, the planar substrate we're growing on, then we would, with exactly the same exercise, get to 35% indium in efficient red emitting quantum wells. So this, this is summarized also in the little table up here. For the blue, you have on gallium nitride, you have 1.6% uh, lattice mismatch. For the green on 10% indium, 1.6. And for the red on 20% indium, 1.6. All seems very easy. It's just to go out and do it. It's not is not perfectly trivial, but that's what we've been doing. So how do we do this? Uh, two things I, I point at in the slides to, to come here. Uh, one is to use uh, perfect nano wire seeds to grow high quality indium nitride pyramids and then transforming these pyramids into thin, approximately 100, 150 or so nanometer thick uh, platelets of C-oriented indium nitride as fully relaxed not connected to the substrate and dislocation free templates for the formation of the nano LED structures. So here's uh, the first approach. We could, uh, you know, with, with control nucleation, you see here some images of Shosha B's technology developed initially for the nano wire growth to form perfect seeds that enable you to, or him, to grow perfect pyramids, hexagonal symmetry pyramids and then transforming these in an annealing experiment where in principle to make the tip unstable and you're left with just a thin platelet that you can use for, for the devices. That was the first approach. You can see that here that uh, for 9% indium in this case, the pyramids develop into these platelets with the emission around 440 nanometers and then enabling green emitting quantum wells. And if we're 18% indium, you, have, you develop the platelets with this technique with a mission around 480 nanometers, enabling the red emitting quantum well technology. So this was published in Nano Letters in 2019, so B as the first author, in gun platelet synthesis and applications towards green and red light emitting dyes. 
so the second approach is the one where we use chemical mechanical polishing. You have the pyramids again, you embed it in silicon oxide, you do this CMP, and then you, you have the platelets here, and then you do HF etching to remove the, the silicon oxide, and here are the platelets. Platelets are not fully flat because of the mechanical polishing, leave some, some uh, curvature top surface. But that uh, sort of be again developed technology. You can see how these uh, multi step uh, features disappear one by one. And when he's finished with this, he has actually, as seen by scanning probe, an atomically flat surface that you can use for uh, your devices. This was published uh, in 2020, in the difficult year of 2020. Realization of high, ultra high quality in-gun platelets to be used at relaxed templates for red micro LEDs. So on top of these, you can then uh, form more or less standard non-OLED devices emitting blue, green, and red, depending on and adjusted to the composition of the relaxed template. These devices are designed and optimized as sub-micron-sized emitters, non-OLEDs, that can either be used as individual subwoofing devices, or they can be assembled. So you can assemble a few of them for, say, two micron-sized pixels, or many more of them to make, say, a 10 micron pixel. So here's a, just an example making a single platelet blue uh, nano LED. This is one that's photographed with, a, with an iPhone camera. Um, so this was actually done for optogenetics where they wanted a, a, a small sub-micron sized uh, light source for optogenetics. Here is uh, an interesting uh, case. Let me see here. Uh, Ah, here it comes. So here you see, uh, that didn't work perfectly well. So let's see if I can get back. So what you can see here is the peak from uh, the gallium nitride. This is 355 or so nanometers. Here's the emission from uh, the, the template material uh, around 440 or so. And here's the emission in this case from a green quantum wells grown on these platelets that you see over here. Here, no, no, that's the one I didn't find, okay. Oop. So, here, the, now we go through the, the peak. Sorry, that was not good language. Ah. So, uh, in the peak of where you had the green emitting one, well, you had this distribution of the emission. You see each of these platelet uh, are perfect, defect-free, defect-free. So you can also see that if you make a small mistake, like a little bit too thick corner well, then you can get, see by the cathodal luminescence imaging, that you have just a few of these platelets working perfectly, in this case, maybe 30% or so. So cathodal luminescence is an ideal tool to identify different modes of defect formation. Now I see I'm, uh, getting towards the end of my time. Uh, here you see an example of a red quantum well with a CMP generated ingot template. So this slide I will have to skip for the sake of time, but it shows interesting stuff you can do with cathodal luminescence for the study. So I just conclude with a couple of slides from uh, the collaboration and the interactions we have with the company Glow AB, which originated as a spin out from my group. Uh, some of the market fields that uh, Glow has been approaching, like contact lens displays with sub two micron sized uh, pixels, uh, head up displays. Yeah, these are the same uh, targets as I showed before. So, as example, what Glow has been achieving to do by uh, primarily by planar growth, both red, green, and blue micro LEDs, uh, and also develop a, a, a direct wafer transfer technology, which means you can transfer these devices onto either silicon, the CMOS, or to a glass substrate with low temperature polysilicon uh, transistors. That means that you can make, for instance, a pixel that is comprised of, in this case, it's 20 micron pixel with two red, because they're a bit weaker, one green and one blue. So this is now led to all kinds of applications, like uh, smartwatches, the contact lens displays, and uh, both made on CMOS and on, on glass. So that brings me to a conclusion. This is sort of a tendentious slide. I have to, I can blame maybe Glow for that, but I think it's pretty cute. 
it says how we used to do a long time ago, you can see liquid crystal displays, how that has, was taken over by the OLED displays. And now I think some of us think that the nano technology based uh, micro or nano and micro LEDs will be the final step in this uh, development going forward with this technology. So with that, I will uh, of course thank you for your attention. Thank all the people that have contributed to this research in my group, my groups, but also the people that have supported this research. Be below this line, you have actually all the support for the academic research. I think by now it's two billion Swedish kroner. Uh, here on top of the line, you have the, the, the investors that supported the industrial development. So with that, I think I can say that uh, this, I think that also in the future, innovative nanomaterial science will continue to, to generate exciting new science, but it will also offer unique and novel solutions to industrial and societal changes, challenges. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lars. <laughs> You have been showing a lot of papers in the past that uh, brought back the uh, great memories. I remember reading those papers, <laughs> really the milestone, many milestones in, in the whole field. So thank you so much. And also thank you for your support on Nano Letters. M many great works uh, were published in Nano Letters. You were serving as our advisory board as well. You know, that, that was just great. Um, I'm glad to see you, you kind of divide this up into kind of every five years, there's a segment of major <laughs> advancements. Uh, that, that just been fantastic. Uh, my first question, uh, Lars, um, related to the LED, I really like the argument by right, early days, why you do nanowire LED, you know, you grow this lattice mismatch materials, nanowire cross section is small, that kind of un can anneal out the defect, not propagate into the whole wire. I, I remember that was early days of uh, uh, thinking. So now compare wires with this uh, micro disc or uh, pyramid, right? Uh, compare also to the bulk LED. Can you share with people just overall view or the thinking compare these yeah. three different three Yeah, different I think there is. There's no difference really between the augmentation for the nanowire advantages with the pyramids and the, and the platelets, because they all are based on the fact that you nucleate in a very small opening, 80 to 100 nanometers or so, you nucleate this little seed, and from that you can either set the conditions such that you grow a nanowire or you develop the, the pyramid. So in, both, in all these cases, you can avoid any dislocations from the substrate. Typically you might have up to 10 to the nine dislocation per centimeter square, but you boy, avoid letting any of those through the small hooks. So they share exactly the same advantage. Yeah. Those in the platelets, there are no dislocations. And apart from being dislocation free, when you have this expanded area over the, over the growth mask, you also have a relaxed structure. Yeah. I mean, to its inherent lattice constant. Okay. So, and also, um, <clears throat> last, and uh, with so many topics right here related to nanowires, uh, you have been working on and also looking at paths in the field, right? Uh, what are the several directions you see in addition to, you know, you look at LED, what are the directions you think are very promising after, you know, more than a couple of decades of experience on, on nanowires? Well, I think in the field of energy, I think nanomaterials is, ob is an obvious choice. I mean, we had a lot of effort with Solvoltaic developing even also large scale, upscale uh, applications. Unfortunately, the funding got into a critical situation, so we couldn't continue with that. But I think it still has a, a great opportunity with, for, for solar energy. Um, but there's also, of course, inefficient lighting, but there is in, in uh, you know, power electronics, uh, for driving our electrical vehicles or for connecting solar energy or wind power to the electrical grid, you need a very powerful devices. And I think that's today very likely going to be more and more of gallium nitride providing the electronics for these applications. So I think I see huge opportunities in the energy field, but yeah. course, many other, I mean, but for, for, for the gallium nitride nanomaterials, I think we have uh, these main opportunities. Yeah. 
So, so last one, last question. Um, so looking at, let's say the electronics again. Um, so using wise, you have been working on all Taiwan nano electronics. Did you see anything particularly promising for reducing the power consumption in terms of new physics, maybe new device structure for you know, energy efficient computing you know, down the road, right? You yeah. look at on the Moore's law, the scaling, mm. and now it's the energy consumption yeah. <laughs> becomes the limiting, limiting yeah. factor. Yeah. Now, I think you can go down to handling very small currents, sort of few electrons by doing this in geometries of the nanowires with rapid control of the electron transport through the nanowires. So I think you're scaling down the current levels and the, the how many electrons you handle to create your zeros and your ones, you have great opportunities. But also the tunnel-based transistors where you can really control the, the uh, power consumption down to, to very small levels and you get sub-threshold slopes that go beyond what you can do with macroscopic uh, and micro and nano electronics. But there are huge opportunities, I would say, in this field still. Okay, Lars, thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll see you in the panel discussion. Let me move on to uh, uh, Julia Greer. Mm -hmm. Well, let's welcome Julia. Julia is a professor of material science mechanics uh, and medical engineering and Caltech. Uh, she's uh, currently serving as a director of the Cavi Nanoscience Institute at, at Caltech. Uh, she's an expert in nanomechanics, uh, certainly receiving uh, many, many awards, multiple career awards from you know, the Department of Defense, Cavi, Nano Letters, NASA, DOE, and DARPA. Um, She's um, certainly also very proud, our associate editor in, in Nano Letters. With that, uh, Julie, please uh, take over the podium. Thank you. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. And it's great to meet you, Lars, I guess, in a 2D world. <laughs> um, thank you, Yi, very much for inviting me. And thanks to everyone for um, uh, participating. For us, it's early in the morning, so a particular thank you to all the West Coasters. Can you see my screen? Yeah. I'm, okay, great. So I'm going to go into the presentation mode so that we don't um, delay things. And I look forward to the panel um, afterwards to actually have a discussion. Um, so jumping right into it, the title of my talk is a mouthful. So materials by design, of course, we'll understand what that means. And then there are a bunch of words, three-dimensional nano-architected metamaterials. So it's a lot of words, hyphenated in fact. And um, my goal is that by the end of this talk, I will have conveyed to you why they, all of these words do in fact be belong in the same sentence. So I imagine that many of us are familiar with a situation like this. You go to the store, you buy all these things that you absolutely need to get. And you know the bags are just not enough, not strong enough to hold all that. And this problem is not unique from the glass that shatters all too easily to the balloons that pop uh, right away. And then to, yeah, I really meant to have um, four children situation. So these are all examples of materials that are, well, very lightweight, of course, right? But because of that, they're very easy to damage and tear. Now, looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, for example, do you remember Remember when flying was a thing and then maybe um, some of you even still remember going to the airport? So a Boeing 747 weighs nearly a million pounds. So that's very, very heavy. And if I were to say, go and visit Lars, if you just do, did a, a back of the envelope calculation at two bucks a gallon for five gallons a mile, my ticket should have cost me nearly $60,000. So I guess I'm glad that we're doing this virtually. So even um, uh, already the Dreamliner reduced its weight by 50% or so, and you can tell the difference that the tremendous amount of expenditures in the airline industry actually comes from the fuel that it's required to propel a million pound machine through the air. So this is an example of, of a material that we know to be strong, but because of that, they're also heavy and expensive. Now, here in California, we have a lot of sunshine. So this is an example of a person installing solar panels on somebody's roof. Well, if this guy accidentally falls off the roof, this is going to be bad news for everyone. And that is because the, the materials that are used to build these solar panels 
are very brittle. So this is silicon, of course. And so um, specialized materials also have this property of being too heavy and um, brittle. And speaking of materials that are too heavy, do you remember how maybe a decade or more ago we, we were discussing this concept of space elevator? Well, as far as I know, there still isn't one. And the reason for that is because of this very busy plot. But let me walk you through this. If you plot some kind of a mechanical attribute, and it doesn't have to be strength, it can be stiffness and it can be um, toughness, as a function of material density, what emerges right away are these colorful domains of all the materials that we know how to make today. And what you see right away is that we are very good as a, as a society of, at making materials that are simultaneously strong and heavy or simultaneously lightweight and weak. What we're not so good at, at least not yet, is getting into the so-called white space where the materials are lightweight, but there's no mechanical sacrifice. Now, this is a log-log plot. So even a modest increment within the space already represents a substantial change. So how do we get into this white region, the so-called white space untapped territory, if everything that we know how to make today is already plotted here? So the way we do it in our group is by utilizing the concept of architecture in materials design. So if you look at the largest man-made monument, so here's, here's the Great Pyramid of Giza, you can see it stands about 150 meters tall and it weighs 6 million tons. So this is very heavy, of course, right? Now, perhaps many of you are familiar with this. Of course, this is the Eiffel Tower. It stands twice as tall and it weighs a thousand times less. So this is three orders of magnitude less and both are still standing. And what this showcases is that a proper way to architect materials to create a structure out of them enables one to use a lot less material with maintaining the same mechanical resilience. So building upon this concept, we took this research into the world of micro-architected materials. What I'm showing you here is the world's most normal dandelion. And there's a nickel micro lattice that's sitting on top of it that's hardly perturbing it at all. And since I have the pleasure of doing this virtually, I can show it to you. Here's the world's light. We held this record of the world's lightest material for about three weeks until the graphene aerogels blew us out of the water. But you can see how, how lightweight it is. It falls down slower than a feather. So these materials, of course, are very, very lightweight. But to be able to simultaneously attain the strength, the lightweight and the strength. We have to go down to three more orders of magnitude to the nano world. And what I'm showing you here are some of the nano architected materials that are made in our group. These particular materials were um, called nano lattices because many of them were periodic. They don't have to be periodic. For example, here's a micro TARDIS. Those of you who are fans of Doctor Who, that's about one ten thousandth of your hair diameter. It's very small. You could see that um, there's an obvious level of porosity, and that is that they're cellular solids. So they have very open architecture, and that's what allows them to be more than 99% air. There is a less obvious level of porosity, and that is that these materials are effectively interwoven three-dimensional networks of hollow beams or hollow tubes. And when you look into this image of a zoomed-in cross-section of a beam, you can see that they're hollow. And the wall thickness here can be on the order of some nanometers, maybe five nanometers or so. Now, when you look at this material as a whole, it's easy to see that it embodies every length scale from some nanometers to hundreds of nanometers and then to microns and hundreds of microns and now millimeters and centimeters. So we call these nanoarchitected materials or metamaterials because their properties can no longer be described simply from the perspective of materials only or from the structural perspective. So now I did tell you that these are very lightweight materials, but I have yet to show you that they're also very strong. So again, looking at the plot of some kind of strength as a function of material size, what we, are, what we and uh, several other groups showed is that again, on the log log plot, there's this power law strengthening of all common metals in their single crystalline form. So what that tells you is that if you take something very malleable, like a gold earring, for example, and reduce its dimensions to about 200 nanometers, it becomes as strong as steel. 
Now take exactly the same metals, but deposit them using different techniques. For example, chemical vapor deposition or, or um, sputtering. And the microstructure, the atomic level microstructure is now nanocrystalline. And what you can see is that this effect is reversed. Smaller is now weaker, not stronger like it was in the case of single crystalline metals. Now smaller is weaker. This is a more modest size effect because it's not on a log log plot. Nevertheless, it's real. Now, when you look at de the deformation of glasses at the nanoscale, and I'd like you to really pay attention to this particular region right here, we all know glasses to be brittle and shatterable when you pull at them, and in fact, they don't offer any tensile ductility. However, this particular glass, it's a special type of glass, is necking in ruptures only after it's been deformed in excess of 100%. So at the nanoscale, glasses apparently are able to be deformable, and here's one last example. This is a single unit cell of a nano lattice that um, I showed you earlier. It's made out entirely of a brittle, very brittle ceramic. So this is titanium nitride ceramic. Um, I don't know if the movie's playing, just one second. Okay, let me just go back one second. I don't know why the movie is not playing. Okay, well, um, this has not happened before. So the movie is supposed to be playing and deforming this. And what you would see is that each individual beam is bending and it's made out of a very brittle ceramic titanium nitride. And it's able to deform over multiple cycles without failure, even when the tensile stress is in excess of 1.5 gigapascals. Ceramics are not supposed to stay intact when you apply that much of tensile stress to them. So the takeaway message here is this. Sometimes materials get stronger. Sometimes they can get weaker. But all of these effects, for example, suppression of brittle failure, occur only at the nanoscale. So the big question was, can we somehow harness this beneficial um, size effect at the nanoscale and proliferate them onto the larger materials? And so this is where the architected materials come into play. What we use is this concept of to photon lithography. And that is that it utilizes the constructive interference of exactly two photons to cross-link your polymer in a very small volume called a voxel. That's what this green dot is. Now, as this voxel is rastered in three-dimensional space, we can write whatever arbitrary architecture that we'd like, and it doesn't have to be periodic, using a photosensitive polymerization process. And after we've written this scaffold, we can coated with a material of interest. It can be a glass, it can be a metal, a ceramic, and then we can etch out the scaffold that was originally written, ending up with a hollow beam replica of the original design. So just to show you a real-time video of what this process looks like, so here's an instrument called Nanoscribe, and it's a two-photon lithography instrument that writes the pattern that you pre-design in real time without any mask. Now, Everything we make is nano-sized or at least micro-sized. And so its deformation can't be easily observable with, with um, just by optical methods. So we have a special instrument that is um, effectively based on the scanning electron microscope. So here you see an SEM chamber and it's equipped with uh, various whistles and bells like the nanomechanical module and uh, cryogenic module as well as electrochemical uh, cell. And these are the so-called different inquisition devices. So we're able to pull on them, we're able to uh, deform them in a variety of different ways. And so what I'd like to share with you here is a video of one of these nano-architected materials where the wall thickness of each individual beam is on the order of 50 nanometers. Now this is alumina, this is a very brittle material. And so of course it's effectively your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis. Now, as we are pushing on it, of course you would expect it to be very brittle and to be very uh, fragile, in fact. And so that's exactly what we're observing. And so you can see that this particular nano lattice crushes and dies. We have a little nano cemetery in our instrument and nothing really unexpected that happened. Now, if we repeat this experiment and the only thing that we do differently now is we reduce the wall thickness by a factor of 10, now that it's, um, it's a, oh, sorry, by a factor of five, now that it's only 10 nanometers thick, same alumina, same brittle material, same architecture, and same microstructure. We would expect it to crush and die even more readily. But what we're observing instead is something very, very different. So we are compressing it and we're expecting it to crush and die and to shatter. And um, we're compressing it by more than 50% in many cases. And this particular ceramic, ceramic thinks that it's a sponge. 
So if this doesn't convince you that there's a size effect and that there's a nano induced size effect that can be proliferated onto larger dimensions, then I should just stop talking about this uh, phenomenon altogether. Now, since that time, we have explored this uh, in a variety of different permutations. For example, these are very complex architectures. What I'm showing you here on the left is a spinodal like bicontinuous material, also very, very brittle. And you can see all the wrinkling that's occurring. Now, with no sacrifice in um, damage susceptibility. So what you can see is this full recovery and energy absorption with or without periodicity, and much more importantly, without any damage initiation. Now, what we also learned is that you can prescribe different gradients of density or effectively trajectories along which failure uh, will occur. And what you can see here is that you the lower part of the crystal quasi-crystal, nanocrystal, um, does it, is deforming fully and densifies fully until the top half is even aware that it's being compressed. Now, these geometries can be very complex in the sense that this uh, particular material is fractal. And um, again, my movie is not playing for some reason. Um, Here we go. So as we're deforming this material, which has fractal beams, and that is that the beams are comprised of self-similar unit cells that populate each individual beam, you can see the kinking in the highest level, in the lowest level of hierarchy, and you expect them to fracture right at these locations, yet they fully recover. Now, now, since that time, we have taken this into a very different realm in the sense that we can really um, utilize the different conceptual design into these nano architectures. For example, this woven type of a geometry that's similar to a hammock doesn't have any nodes. And so we can further bypass any kind of even very small nano sized uh, damage initiation. And so what these materials offer, for example, is the resistance in tensile ductility. This is an example of don't push on a rope. So when you pull on it, it has a tremendous amount of extensibility and then exactly the same material can be reversed and then compressed. And as, it, as you're compressing it, it still offers resistance. So it's effectively a rope that can be pushed or pulled with uh, resistance and stiffness um, in uh, both uh, directions. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of the mechanics that I was going to show you um, in the sense of explaining how the size effect manifests itself in these architectures. And it has a lot to do with susceptibility to defects. For example, this recoverability is a phenomenon that would be only present in the materials whose thickness is only maybe 10 nanometers or so that's wrapped around a very large architecture in contrast to a giant building like this, which, and I'm sure there's a building like this in um, Singapore somewhere, so that if we were to preserve this self-similarity of the ratio of the wall thickness to the radius of the concrete pipes that comprise this building, and some giant were to come and step on this building, of course, it would never spring back like we're observing in our nanostructures. And what that entails, the, the, the implicit size effect here is that we're able to make much more ideal, much more perfect materials when they're limited in their at least one dimension at, down to the nanometer length scale and then fill up as large of a volume as you want. Now, because it's all about defects, I wanted to share with you some of the deformation, some of the uh, learnings we uh, obtained in the last year or so on carbon. So this is a graphitic carbon nanopillar and we're compressing it. Um, now you all know graphite and carbon generally to be very much um, a brittle material. So watch the stress level here. So this is a single individual pyrolytic carbon nanopillar and you can see how much it's not enjoying being compressed. So the stress level gets up to about seven gigapascals. And then this particular very, very glassy carbon pillar thinks that it's rubber. So we, we're hoping that we could utilize this behavior and construct a nano architected material out of this, having learned that it's these very small curled fragments of sp2 hybridized carbon that allow for these sheer localized deformations that enable such rubber like response um, in both compressive and tensile ductility. This this uh, work was done in collaboration with my colleague Xiaoyan Li at Tsinghua University who demonstrated that this is possible under compression and tension. But what we learned is that 
defects still very much play a crucial role in the deformation of these um, nano, nano architected materials, because even though each individual building block is a rubber like glassy carbon, very strong nano pillar, when you start architecting with them and using them as nano sized building blocks to create these nano architected materials, they are very strong, but they don't recover. So particular attention must really be paid uh, to defects. And I believe I don't have that much more time left. Is that accurate? Still have five more minutes. Five more minutes. All right, then I'm that. That's terrific. Thank you. So I would like to summarize a little bit uh, before jumping into the next five minutes of my talk. If you remember back to the beginning, our big question was: Can we get into the white space, and how close can we get to the theoretical predictions? So what I'm showing you here are these oblong type data sets. This is all our data that we've collected in the last. A uh, few years, and what you can show, you can see right away is that, for example, making fractal nano lattices gives us two more orders of magnitude in the reduction of relative density, and very much venturing into the white space where people hadn't yet been. Now, these are the hollow nano lattices from the Illumina work that you saw earlier. These are the fractal nano lattices, and what you can see is that, sure, we're not quite in the white space where we would like to be eventually, but it's definitely paving a way to venture into that. So this combination of the nano size size effect and the nano architected materials certainly offers this uh, pathway to get into the white space. Now, what we also learned is that when you're dealing with carbon materials, we can in fact get very close to the theoretical limit and especially at the higher densities. So what we're plotting here is the strength again, as a function of density, just to remind you that this is a log, log space. These kinds of material property spaces are very typical for a variety of different materials. Now, these are the different natural materials and composites and ceramics. And so these are our carbon, pyrolytic glassy carbon type uh, materials that I'm showing you here. I also would like to point out that this notion of theoretical limit has to be rethought and reevaluated when you're dealing at these with these uh, nano uh, scale materials. And so this is no longer just the strength of the of the carbon carbon bond, but now take into account the graphene, the graphite and many other carbon based uh, materials. So we were pleased to see that compared to say graphene and diamond that the nano lattices are certainly offering a trajectory to get to these very, very high strengths. Now, Switching gears just a little bit, and I mentioned that everything at the nanoscale was still very much governed by defects. Well, one of the, just to tie it together also to Lars's talk, I'd like to show you one of the biggest defects or pests, um, and that is the lithium dendrite formation during electrochemical cycling of a battery. So this is some of our more recent work. So this is a solid state thin film battery, which is originally lithium metal free. And what you can see is the formation of these of these uh, notorious lithium dendrites, which effectively break through and tear through the copper current collector and grow out of the electrolyte. Now, these dendrites have been a pest and have been pestering um, the battery community for many years now. So we set out to investigate, well, why is it that they're able to break through everything and why are they so prevalent? So what you're observing here is a fully electrochemically formed dendrite, one of these individual dendrite that we were able to pick out in the sea of maybe 83 gazillion of them. And what we managed to do is to isolate a single one that's about 300 nanometers in diameter and to compress it mechanically to try to understand its strength under compression because clearly they're very strong and there's something about the yield strength of lithium that maybe is being misunderstood. And what we learned is that lithium is actually much more complicated than what uh, uh, people may have attributed uh, this 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 um, lithium dendrite formation to earlier. And that is that its strength is in fact size dependent. And at these very small dimensions um, of lithium, it also becomes much stronger at this at the sizes of the nuclei and especially as the dendrites form. Um, and so what we're what we're showing here is that these are our electrochemically formed dendrites, and you can see that they're actually an order of magnitude stronger than what lithium is thought to be. So we can certainly investigate these nano size effect in the context of the defects that form. Now, having learned quite a bit of electrochemistry from our esteemed colleagues, 
and about the nano architected materials, we've actually been actively making batteries out of these nano architected materials. And the last example I'd like to share with you is a tetragonal micro lattice, which again is lithium free to begin with. So the nickel here serves as the current collector. The active material is the amorphous silicon that's deposited conformally all around each individual beam. So each beam effectively is a storage cell and then will lithiate it electrochemically. And so watch what happens here. This is a top view of one of these micro lattices as it's being lithiated. And what you can see is the formation of these patterns. Now I'm a musician, so to me, they look like violins, but some may say that these are sinusoidal patterns. So I'm showing you the top view as well as the tilted side view. And you can see that these beams are able to alleviate the stress buildup in response to lithiation by buckling out of plane and in plane. And you can see this buckling is coordinated. Now, what my, my former student who worked on this project, Xiao Xing, Xia discovered is that depending on the degree of lithiation, you can actually measure the different band gaps that emerge throughout the structure. And so the amount of lithiation, first of all, is irreversible in that as soon as you remove the stimulus, it doesn't go away. And so it locks in that architecture. And that allows us to induce different degrees of freedom, for example, out of plane buckling as well as expansion and uh, bending. And so what we learned is that you can actually pre-build a particular pattern as long as you understand the defect behavior and how coordinated that buckling is. So what I'm about to show you is one of these micro lattice batteries. Now I can share with you that we built in a particular defect pattern in there and watch what happens upon lithiation. That's all we're doing. We're just lithiating this battery. You can very clearly see the buckling pattern forming, right? But now you can also see that we can prescribe a particular domain boundary or rather a particular pattern using these imperfections and the defects. And of course, hopefully you see the resemblance between the pattern that's formed here with my little logo here on the right. So with that, I think it's probably a good point to stop and to, and to summarize a bit. And I think the key message I'd like to leave with is this. If you are clever about three particular aspects of material design, one of them, of course, is the specific architecture that you're prescribing. What kind of architecture are you interested in? Is it periodic? Is it aperiodic? Is it a nanotardis? What is it that you're really after? Um, the second one that's very important is the nanomaterials in their response to the size effect. Every material has some kind of a size effect associated with it, but it's not uncoupled from its microstructure. And that's the third knob here, which is the atomic arrangements. Um, and it's very different depending on this combination of the external dimensions and the underlying atomic level microstructure. Once you understand these three very critical parameters, we, you're able to create materials with entirely uncoupled properties, uh, combinations of properties and attaining entirely new white space within material design. And with that, I just would like to say a huge thank you to, to Yi, of course, for inviting me to give this talk to all of you for listening. And of course, I am the one who talks about this, but this is my group. And I just like to remind myself that there used to be a time when we all really enjoyed being together without masks and outside. And this is, um, so this is my group from, I guess, a couple of years ago and a huge acknowledgement and a gra gratitude to my funding sources. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Julia. Um, well, in a couple of months, I think we, we can all get back to see our groups or having fun together, I, I guess, after we all get vaccinated. That's, um, <laughs> that's the hope, right? <laughs> So you show this beautiful, I really like it. This, this picture when the stress coming in, it buckle that uh, silicon coating, that, that's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. It's uh, fun. Yeah. Judah, let me ask you first question. Uh, you have the 3D metal materials architecture when you press on it. Um, well, let's thinking about certainly globally, you are seeing this deformation like this, but locally there's a lot of bending motion, right? And the size effect, the thickness of roughly about 10 nanometers and below, you start to see something dramatic on the wall thickness. So can you educate us a little bit? Uh, if you think about locally and what's the deformation, the nature of deformation, why there? And are you really stretching the chemical bond or compress the chemical bond? Or are you translate this into a bending motion? How do, how, how do people think about this? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, thank you. This is a terrific question. And I actually have a slide about this. Uh, maybe this is the best place to, to show this. Um, sorry, can you still see my screen? Yeah. OK, so when you look at this architecture, for example, let me play this video one more time. You can see that locally there are regions of tensile stresses and compressive stresses as well as wrinkling. So all the phenomena that you're bringing up are effectively mechanical. So the level of deformation is not quite at the atomic bond level, but we're certainly accumulating some damage. And in fact, there's some micro cracks can even that form when the stress concentrations at these local spots, especially at the nodes, exceed the fracture strength of the material. Now, the nice thing is that they're not, they're subcritical. And that's what gives rise to this less than ideal scaling. For example, when I showed this plot, you can see that the slope here is linear. So for something that's driven by, uh, in, the, in fact, let me go to full presentation mode. When your material is so-called stretching dominated, you should see this linear scaling between like, like so, this is the slope here, between the strength or stiffness and um, the reduction, oh my gosh, and the reduction in density. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my, I don't know why this keeps on jumping. This is what I meant to show you, right? But what you see here is that it's less than ideal and that's because of this damage initiation. So what you can see in the slope in our nano lattices, at least in the ones that don't have any hierarchy built into them, is that the slope is less than ideal. And it's specifically because of these local deformations and possibly micro crack formation and the local processes that are not recoverable. So as a collective response, they don't fail the material or the presence. So it's the structure is effectively resilient against defect in the sense that this, the overall response is not affected too much. But at the local scale, of course, there's damage initiation. And that's one of the reasons why we turn to these no, uh, where did I show? Yeah, this one, to these node free architectures where we don't see this kind of level of damage accumulation. So just to show you uh, one more time. So you can see that these interwoven architectures don't have a single node. And so there's no, there are no stress concentrations. And so in that sense, just like you were bringing up, it's bending and twisting that's mm -hmm. accommodating the strain. And then there's no damage accumulation. Yeah, so so Julie, a, another question. Um, you know, you are showing great example on the the you know, tens of nanometer rough in that size range, combined with this uh, micron, this architecture right there. So this combination together with the defects such as dislocation, right, and and so all this defect. You know, what what would be the idea to combine all this thinking together, engineer the best materials out of it? Yes, 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 yes. You, what you're saying is music to my ears. That's exactly the holy grail, I think, because it's all about the separation of scales, right? So just like you're mentioning, so at the characteristic material length scale, you have defects like point defects or dislocations or vacancies, etc. Now, when you get up to zoom out effectively to the hundreds of nanometers, maybe their collective dislocation cell walls formation, right? Or in amorphous materials, maybe their collective void uh, formation or something like that. And then when you architect it, now you're dealing with a separation of scale where it's more of a homogenized response. And I think this is where there's a tremendous opportunity for computational material science to somehow integrate the atomic level precision where it's necessary to the microstructural precision to then eventually to the optimization uh, type models. The part that's really missing right now is the in situ diagnostic and decision making when digital materials are being created. So it would be such a powerful tool if we could be writing these materials, you know, at the large scale in the additive manufacturing type framework and diagnosing their health in terms of the defects in situ and then optimizing the, de the design as a response to what's being formed and maybe using some machine learning algorithms to optimize that structure as it's iteratively being created. That intelligence has yet to be built in. So a lot of these materials, they're cool, they're interesting, they're terrific educational platforms, but they're all forward design in the sense that once we know the dislocation density or once we know the size effect, we architect something and we understand those properties. What we don't know right now is to say, 
I would like to have a winter jacket that at these temperatures, its thermal capacity is this, but when it gets you know cooler outside or when it gets hotter, hotter outside, the architecture responds in a way that it still stays mm -hmm. warm just by the virtue of that trigger, triggered response. That would be phenomenal, right? But we don't yet have this ability of the inverse design going from property uh, back down. And I think this is where it's so important that at the fundamental level, we understand each relevant process first and then develop this very powerful computational network. Yeah, well, thank you, Julia. Now let me bring uh, also Lars and Chen back to the uh, stage. Let's have a panel discussion. Yeah. So three of you today, uh, you know, show the audience three different, very different topics. I all enjoy, enjoy them. Maybe let me come back to Chen first. Um, Chen, I, I watched since your, your, your graduate school work, you know, you work on um, uh, the, uh, this micron size particle assembly, be beautiful work with uh, Stephen Granick. Uh, and then you started to, after that, to go down to a smaller landscape mm -hmm. and started to look at the uh, nanostructure, cell assembly, and liquid cell, right? So I thinking about, you know, your, your trajectory, so what's, uh, what's in the future? You know, I, I think you're presenting very exciting topic you're still working on, but, but in the you know, grand scheme of self-assembly. So what's, what are the key exciting problems you, you see in the, for the, maybe the next decade to come? Now, this is 20 years of uh, nano letter, So this is the time for us to brainstorm a little bit about <laughs> what, what's, uh, what's down the road for the next 10 years. Right, right. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So I'd, I'd like to first mention this uh, transition, as you mentioned, from my PhD work to my postdoc work and to my work going on right now is actually driven by my curiosity on imaging. So, so for me, I hope in the future I can really label myself as an imaging person and I can see there are a lot of opportunities we can actually uh, discover based on imaging and the nanoscale. Because the nanoscale, there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of morphology questions related to the properties. For example, if we focus back to self-assembly or the nanoscale, one big question could also be related to what Julia just mentioned, essentially the inverse engineering of a sample structure out of nano size building blocks. So currently the, build, the big challenge is uh, the uh, building block, how they self-assemble kinetically because uh, they can actually sample over a very complicated free energy landscape. So how to really make sure the building blocks can actually go over all the possible kinetic traps to the final target that's actually not easy at all. So that's why for now we have been focusing on fundamental question on understanding such kinetic pathways. And in the future, what we can hope to do is to build a huge computational database, build a huge experimental data set for machine learning so that we can actually get the experiment during the, on the fly, basically, so during the experiment, we actually inform the experimentalist how to fine tune the experimental condition to essentially get the building blocks to follow a particular type of pathway towards the final self-assembly structure. So that's more on the self-assembly side. And then on the imaging side of other, other types of nanoscale systems, we can extend to a biological system, which is really something I um, have great passion in. There's a lot of opportunity we can dig into that. And of course, another direction would be to really look into how morphology at the nanoscale can relate to performances, which I believe is also greatly tied with the atomic composition and also that deformation, uh, how they respond to external stimulus on the atomic level. So if, for example, again, when I look at Junior's beautiful structure, I couldn't help imagining how about I can actually image those structures and the stress as, with atomic resolution to really see how the string gets redistributed within those nano-sized basic building blocks. I think that would be really cool. And that can really revolutionize our understanding on how to engineer the properties of nanoscale materials. Here we go. You can have an in-situ uh, TEM nano and in there <laughs> to look at this. <laughs> and the nano architect at scale, right? Yeah. 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 That would be, yeah. Really cool. <laughs> that would be really amazing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I could ask a similar question last to you. Uh, for the next decade to come, 
I, I mean, you have been uh, pioneering the whole nano why with you know Libra, Paydon, several people, uh, and uh, so what's the next decade to come? Whether it's related to wires or, or something else, just just brainstorming a little bit, you know, pick up your thoughts. Well, I, I think there might be exciting things happening in this materials assembly, design materials assembly, to for instance, to, to, to mimic neural systems, to, to behave similar to brain, the brain handles information and communication in, in huge advanced uh, networks. It might be handling electrical signals, it might be optical signals, it might be something that we haven't thought of yet, but just the ability to actually assemble materials into complex networks and then huge the properties of these. That would be maybe on the more visionary blue sky things for the future. Um, another, looking a little bit more technically, I think with the, the, the uh, rapid development now of micro LED technology, where you should know that in the micro LEDs, it's almost a completely empty surface. It's just a few percent that is used of the surface for the actual devices, which means that you can incorporate sensors of all kinds on, on these surfaces. You can also think of having multiple layers mm. of the, these displays. You can make true three-dimensional television. So uh, th that's another vision that I, I one can think about. Is so that for nano people? Who is going to watch that? Those kinds of TVs, nano people. <laughs> I think I think most of us would actually be pretty keen on seeing three-dimensional uh, moving images. At least I could imagine doing it. Not for long, but for a while. Yeah. So Julia, what about nanomechanics, you know, uh, for the next decade? Or maybe you want to expand, you know, beyond nanomechanics, that's fine. Well, you know, we've been doing so much uh, chemistry lately, actually, and doing additive manufacturing. So if I were to look forward, the exciting, the exciting direction to me is materials that are architected in space and time. So building mechanical logic into these nanoarchitected materials, right? So the idea would be that you can learn, you, your materials can be nanoarchitected such that they respond to a stimulus, right? And that stimulus can be external or internal. And that stimulus can also eventually become smart in the sense that your structure de decides by itself how to respond to it. So right now we've been working so much in the nanoarchitected space and as far as I know, most of the work is is a passive response. So you apply a stimulus and then it responds and it either locks in that shape or it goes back once you remove the stimulus. That stimulus can be electro, uh, chemical, <clears throat> it could be just electrical, it could be optical, of course. But what Lars is describing, just to build a little bit upon that point, is to, to liken their response more to like a neural network, right? So that you can have decision-making capabilities built into these three-dimensional nano architectures. And that will guide the design principles as well, because not only will that dictate the types of materials and the length scale that needs to be incorporated into it, but it'll bring in the logic through, and I'm hoping through in the nanomechanics. For example, you can use nanomechanics to create um, a potential uh, landscape, a potential energy landscape within these nanoarchitected materials, such that upon the application of one or more stimuli, they will respond in exactly the way that not only do you intend it to be, but that can learn itself, that, that can learn on its own uh, through a machine learning mechanism, I guess. So to me, that's what's exciting. It's building logic into these nanoarchitected materials and enabling decision-making capability. And I think this is where we have a huge opportunity uh, to develop these in-situ diagnostics and computational tools that I think both Gian and I were bringing up. Yeah. I'll ask uh, three of you uh, one last question, uh, then we'll end today's uh, panel discussion. Um, we have a lot of young students and postdocs watching online. Uh, this is one channel right here inside Zoom, but it is another channel that most of them are watching on the other channel. So looking at you know, what's the exciting opportunity you guys all mentioned for the next decade to come. So what about for young students and postdocs? What's the advice do you have for uh, these young scientists to just starting their career doing research? What should they think about? 
who wants to take this first? <laughs> Maybe I'll I go. Don't, don't, oh, okay. don't, don't be tactical. Just follow your heart, what your dreams, what you are most intrigued about, what you think is super interesting and exciting area to move in for, for the research. Don't try to predict what would be technical or right to do. Do what you think is great, would be great fun. I'd like to build so, on that a, a little bit. Um, I completely agree with this, but I also think what's really important is that work hard to build your, your toolbox. I think it's very important that when you are a grad student, especially, is to really, really get your fundamentals down. Because it's really fun for us to say, oh, this is my vision, this is where I think we're going. But that's because we all have already gone through the boot camp of learning our fundamentals. <laughs> we are able, you can only appreciate the beauty of working at the nanoscale and in these new territories. Once you've sort of passed a certain bar of getting your fundamentals down so well that you can appreciate the beauty of it. It's just like with math, right? You've got to get your math fundamentals before you can appreciate how beautiful that is, right? So I would say the most important thing is don't forget to work hard. I think right now it's so easy to get information. It's so easy. You just look everything up, right? So I think that we're losing this culture of working hard and we're losing this culture of recognizing that things don't work the first time. I have a four-year-old son who gets frustrated when he can't get something the first time. And it's like, that's how the world works. Nothing works the first time, right? And so I'm starting to see this a little bit in graduate students that they're kind of getting impatient to get something to work. And I would like to just kind of point out that we all went through that. Nothing works the first time. And very often things don't work by the 10th or even the 83rd time, you know, and you've got to have that little driver inside that allows you to get up every morning and try for the 101st time. Eventually it will work, but you've got to get through that sort of building your fundamentals and really strengthening your toolbox before you can move into the visionary world. Julia, did your, what you said remind me of my graduate school. So many, so many failures. <laughs> just need so to many. get up the next morning, continue. Yeah, well, Chen. Sometimes you just want to rip your hair out, right? I mean, <laughs> Okay. Uh. Yeah. I can. I can also talk about some. Some. Some thinking here. Since I'm. Clo I'm probably closest to uh current graduate students and postdocs. So in addition to what Lars and Julia mentioned, I uh, also. I also feel it's now actually a good time for you to start to think about the logic of your projects and try to really understand why this project is defined this way. And this taste of really establishing a project together with a whole research program can really be very beneficial for you in the long term. Because a research career is actually a very long career, you need to keep renovating yourself. And how you're renovating yourself is actually based on those small pieces of sparklings of wisdom that you can actually get from conversations from others. In particular, today, I actually got a lot of inspirations uh, from those two talks today, from discussions today, and that may actually give us some impact in the long future as my career continue to grow. So keep those interactions alive. Of course, at the same time, remember to follow your heart as Lars mentioned and keep working hard as Julia mentioned. <laughs> yeah, this okay. is just fantastic. Let me also add in one thing just, just to be complimentary to what you said. So I, I learned so much from your talks. I also see particularly last from your talk is reveal the past. You kind of, kind of figure out some new new things from your talk because your the pa the paper you are showing from the last twenty years. I mean, I read all those papers. That's when I was in graduate school reading your papers, right? Now, still after some some papers twenty years, I still say, wow. Now this brought back the memory. Now this new idea just uh, uh, appealing in, in in my brain right here. So in Chinese, we call this as a Wen Gu Zi Xin. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, so I think this is great. Well, thank you so much for today's uh, talks and panel discussion.